The dawn of civilization. Primitive. Dangerous. Exciting. The handwriting is on the wall. If the human race is ever going to amount to anything, it needs... The most civilized caveman I have ever seen. Ah, oh, look who's come out of his cave. This is Shane from Cave Dweller Music. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I have my co-host Brendan with me, and I am joined by Tom from uh, Rochester, UK band Allfather. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time. No worries. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Fantastic. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know you, doesn't know the band, do you want to maybe just tell us a little bit about what you do and what the band is all about? Sure. I am the uh, vocalist from uh, Allfather. We've been going now for... Um, creeping towards 10 years uh i think the end of 2024 20 start of 2025 will be the sort of 10 year anniversary of us of us starting uh we're a four piece from rochester which is just outside london uh in the uk we've recorded uh quite a bit of stuff i think this is our third proper record but we've got a couple of eps we've got some singles um and we've just released um our third album well third record if you get in trouble for calling it an album so it's only 27 minutes long our third record uh a violent truth we play heavy metal but that's sort of built off a foundation of sort of sludge and hardcore and over the years we've found ways to sort of throw into the pot as many different styles and genres as we can without it sounding um not like all father um, and that our, our basic approach is just trying to write heavy music that's that's passionate and we enjoy playing and we enjoy listening to. Fantastic. Because I was going to ask you about that. I was kind of thinking, like, how do you even classify your band? There's so much that goes into it, so much that's going on. But, I mean, obviously, it always sounds like you. Um, but, yeah, you guys are all over the place genre-wise. I love it. Yeah. It's got – I love, the like, the hardcore elements, and it's that's what caught me. I was like, damn, these guys got breakdowns. They're sick. They're like, but they're not like your traditional style, you know, like it kind of just flows. It's really good, man. Thank you. Yeah. Our, our, our approach has been, I mean, we're all music fans that sort of probably between the four of us these days cover most elements of heavy music um, and to some extent alternative music as well. And we're... You know, we love thrash music, we love death metal, we love hardcore, we love sludge. Uh, I love ska music and punk music, and Andrew, our guitarist, loves pretentious black metal and all that sort of stuff. So uh, what we try and do is just use use those influences to be able to create music that excites us, first and foremost, because I figure that's the sort of music that, that, that will excite others as well, um, uh, and ensure that we we put it together in a way that works and the the um commonality of what all father is sits through that which again sort of like i said it's built on that foundation of sort of sludge and hardcore but um without wanting to continuously go back to that we just find ways to to travel that road in different ways really and probably this this record of violent truth is, has been our most uh eclectic not probably the right word for it but um the most the biggest mashup of stuff that, that that we've done um and we're we're really proud of it and we enjoy we, we we've been playing those songs for about two years now and we we're, we're still playing them live we're, we're basically playing the whole record live at the moment and it's it's still so much fun to play awesome oh, yeah. i mean, I, def- I definitely connect with what you said about uh making music that you want to hear and you want to play because i think that's one of the yeah. most important things in making an album that people are going to feel passionate about is that you feel passionate about it um and i think musicians should always be making music for themselves first and the audience second uh it, you should be playing something you don't actually enjoy yourself right yeah i mean i'm not i'm not embarrassed to say but last saturday night i'd had a few beers and i was listening to music and i thought yeah i'm gonna put on put on my record and have a sing along to myself on it because um because because i because i enjoy it so much and um that's not necessarily the same with the rest of the band i don't think but i i still love listening to it um and yeah it's it's really important to us that we we're happy with the music that 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 we've made one of the reasons the record's 27 minutes long and not longer is because we we had other songs and we were like 
with the, the band as a, as a as a whole were not happy with a couple of other tracks that we had. I think we threw out along the way of writing and the writing process for this was complicated because of lockdowns and all sorts of things. Yeah. But we, probably, we probably had in various different versions another four or five songs ranging from a guitar, probably just a guitar demo to a pretty much fully written song and everything in between. And there were points where like, we're not happy with this. Let's, let's, let's kick it out. And just concentrate on the on the stuff that we are are happy with. Right. Um, I sometimes think Al, our guitarist, loves writing stuff and then <laughs> then throwing it in the bin more than he likes writing stuff and keeping it. This little yeah. cheek appears on his face when we say no, we'll bin it, and he's like, yeah, let's bin it. So uh, <laughs> that 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 attention to to quality, what we think is quality at least, is 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 a really important part of the band. Self editing, I think, is probably the. Um, technical term for it we self-edit a lot to ensure that we're really happy with what we play right i mean that's that's an important part of the process i think for sure yeah i, I do find it funny sometimes though how a band will, will put out a song and an album like well that was the one we were least happy with and then that's the one that blows up and the fans absolutely love that one like um ronnie james dio that song um i think it was rainbow in the dark he hated yeah. that song and he he actually wanted to scrap it from the album and the, the rest of the band was like no i think people will like it and force him to keep it on and that may not being like one of his most famous songs ever. Dude, one of so the biggest good. heavy metal songs ever, isn't it? So yeah, <laughs> uh, it's just uh, if they hadn't talked to Matt, we never would have heard that one, which is pretty funny. <laughs> that would have been a shame. <laughs> it would have. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of like the, I, I love the stuff how bands now from the '60s and '70s they're discovering like lost tracks, stuff they never released that they thought wasn't good enough. Like um, there was that Door song that came out. I think it was last year that was like fantastic track that no one had ever heard that was on. Some like uh, they had like a mix of it lost in someone's house or something. It's like, oh, I found this unreleased <laughs> song. I, I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I think I think one of the differences between um, the sort of music recorded back then and I think there's so much, there's so many bands now and so much recording being done. But I think back then, you know, to some extent, sort of the bigger bands that you get now have the time to just record and record and record. Mm-hmm. And be able to be like, oh no, let's not put that out because I, I remember I was listening to um, uh, the Lisa in the Bronx does a mm-hmm. does a podcast and they had a sort of anniversary. I think it was ten year or fifteen year of the Bronx too, and it was their big that was their album that 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 blew up and they spent I don't know three months recording recording a punk album or maybe even longer, and they built like little vocal booth in this big thing and like the time they had to like put into recording it and obviously it's one of my favorite albums so it certainly mm-hmm. paid off but um i think the vast majority of bands these days simply don't have that luxury of being able to piss about for three months <laughs> like right. day after day trying right. to you know write it writing music and recording it and things like that you know we we probably had all in all maybe 14 or 15 days of recording uh for this spread across i think almost 18 months but um you know that's not that's that's not sort of moaning about it but i think the um just the concept of recording of recording music these days is for the vast majority of bands so vastly different to definitely i think what what used to happen in the past in terms of just the sheer amount of resource available to be able to to be able to do it you know Right, like your, la- flight- your labor would just pay for you, bankroll the whole thing. It's like here's here's months worth of studio time. Well, it was like rancid yeah. after the, after out come the walls got flown. They I think spent six months in Jamaica writing the follow up. You know, just like yeah. Yeah. let's just go to Jamaica for six months and write a record. Is is uh, you know an insane insane thought in in twenty twenty three, right? Right. Yeah, <laughs> this just doesn't happen anymore unless you're like Taylor Swift or something like that. You know, it's like yeah, really indeed, achievable. <laughs> I saw this thing that kind of blew my mind that uh, Taylor Swift is so big that her current uh, US tour has actually boosted the national economy. Like economists are, t- <laughs> are talking about the impact that she's had on the US economy. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. I, 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 I don't know how old you guys are, but I think um, Taylor Swift came out when I was already old. <laughs> she's, yeah. she's always been sort of like a, um, uh, a teeny bop type right figure to me whether she is or not and i know she's done lots of stuff but i know lots lots, for lots of people she was kind of a gateway into 
you know more alternative music in in uh in some way but i never never realized she was sort of that popular in terms of a uh, of a star but that's crazy that's that's mad yeah she's the number one earning female artist in the world uh, i know that and uh yeah my wife's right. like obsessed with her so i know a bit about it through my wife but um <laughs> yeah just the the amount of money people throw at her is just insane wow there you go <laughs> that's why um, so, um, so I mean, like the other thing is, there's this whole trend now of solo artists with Bandcamp and like Spotify and stuff who just literally the second they finish writing something, upload it, go straight into the next. And uh, these dudes churn out like 10, 15 albums a year. Sometimes I've seen it's absolutely crazy. It, it is so the, the ability to record music is so accessible these days. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I've I've got a little side project with a couple of couple of people in in the us and we you know a little black metal project called wretched empires and i've uh me and uh so i do vocals on it obviously and will who does the majority of the songwriting i've literally never spoken to him we we communicate mostly through through dms on on twitter and i've known him for for years uh we've ah. literally ever exchanged spoken words together and we've got a four track EP up on Bandcamp and we're in the process of recording the uh the second one at the moment. Um and he's done it pretty much all from his his basement. Um I, I can't record vocals shouting into a laptop unfortunately. I've I um I need to go to a, a little studio and have a proper setup to do it. Uh, you know yeah. bedroom recording vocals for me is, is something I just I can't do. But mm-hmm. A lot of the other stuff he does is is basically you know uh, at home and um you can create really good great stuff from fr- from your home these days and yeah. in some ways i think it i think it's great because the um uh the accessibility of being able to create music is really important and you know in essence it's one of the the key themes of what punk music was when it starts um DIY. downside of it now there are now 10 billion million trillion yeah. bands <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oversaturation is definitely an issue currently um yeah because like obviously you know we have the, the music review side of the podcast and stuff just the sheer amount of stuff we get submitted and have to trawl through and stuff is just it's insane yeah, yeah you can yeah. get like you can get like on on a, on a Friday twenty technical death metal albums being released. Yeah, <laughs> not not twenty metal albums, not twenty death metal albums, twenty tech metal death metal albums. Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. just it, it, it's none of them are like you know the, the quality you know ranges, but often none of them are, are, are trash or bad music sort of mm-hmm. thing. A lot of it's really really good, but there is just so much of it these days that um it's it, it's scary like on one hand it's it, it is great because mm-hmm. there is just so much to explore and to find but trying to fo- trying to find it is is often really really difficult yeah. for a fan and for a band to try and get your head above the the pulpit that people take notice in a way that was probably easier 10 15 years ago is also can also be really really difficult well, that's the thing we've, we've talked about this a few times. And I, on the side from this, I do music PR stuff for bands. I do like press kits and mailers and that sort of thing. But um, what's it's, what's important now for musicians is they're 50% musician and 50% marketing agent or PR agent for themselves. Because um, half of it's making the music that people want to hear, but the other half is getting it to people and making sure that they see you and you stand out. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and, it, and it is, and that's what I do. That's my job in the band. <laughs> so, um you know, I, I I do vocals, but my musical talents don't go far beyond writing lyrics and phrasing and stuff like that. So I've always taken on that that element of the band in terms of working out how to do the the, the PR and things like that. Mm-hmm. And in the past, we've used so we've never been necessarily we've, we were almost signed to a label on our first record for a bit, but that didn't didn't go well. And technically, we weren't when we released the record anyway, but. Um, we've never been signed by a label. We've been working mm-hmm. with Trepanation Records this time round. They're doing our CDs and tapes, but we're not we're not signed to them in a in a traditional way that you would with a label. So right. we've always we've always been independent. The last two records, so Bless the Earth with Fire and Desolation, we use paid PR, and that really helped us to to get our get ahead of the parapet this time round. 
um, combination of things, one of which being not having loads of money lying around mm-hmm. uh, and me having, I, I hoped at the time, enough experience and working with Dan from, from Trepanation to be able to mm-hmm. get enough press to make it worth it on this record. And due to just the relationships I've formed over the years on Twitter and um, uh, and things like that, like doing a few other side projects, doing a bit of a little bit of writing for other stuff, going on podcasts, mm-hmm. sort of fingers crossed. I was hoping that we, that would there would be enough of those relationships in place to to be able to do a little PR campaign ourselves, and it's it's paid off. And um, awesome. uh, we're really, really pleased with the uh, with the response that uh, to the record got. Probably not like we got more. Uh, qualitative than quantitative responses so i think right uh, we 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 got some really good reviews this time around for so, some of the sort of bigger bigger blogs and uh podcasts and things like that without necessarily getting into like the proper big ones you know yeah, but yeah. um uh and i think last time with the paid pr we probably got similar but we got loads and loads of little reviews as well as well that were you know not 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 unhelpful but you know, sort of one man bands where seven people read the yeah. read the blog sort of thing. You know, you're grateful for them doing it, but it's not going to change the world. So we're right. really happy with with the response this time around and being able to do that. And um, um, yeah, and it's been it's been we've been able to speak to people like you and uh, uh, and others. So um, and next time around, I don't know what we'll do, but um, we're really happy that we're able to to do things ourselves. DI the DIY aspect of what we do is. Is, is important to us I, t- I wish we didn't have to do it all the time <laughs> yeah our, our thing is diy because we have to not because we want to um, <laughs> so uh but but you know do it doing things yourselves meaning you only have to rely on yourselves or or only a few other people really is quite important to us as well so it's been nice to be able to be able to have that have that control as well definitely yeah. i i would say that it you do it the right way. I think for a lot of bands, sort of when these, they're building those connections and when they're making those relationships, it's good to use something like a paid service because that puts you in connection with a lot of those blogs and publications who may not have heard your name or may not have heard your stuff before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once they cover you once, if you reach out to them as a band again with the second one, being like, hey, you covered me last time. Do you want to check this out again? You know, that connection is already there. So Absolutely. I think that's that, a good mm-hmm. Yeah. And, that, and that's what we relied on. And that's, and that's what, and that's what's happened. So, um, yeah, we were really, really happy with that. Awesome. Um, Brendan, did you have some questions? I know you had some stuff lined up you wanted to ask. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you guys just went on a, uh, a recent tour, played some shows? Uh, I think tour is probably uh, over-egging it somewhat. We've, 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 played a <laughs> couple of, we've played a couple of release shows that, um, again, we've pretty much sorted out ourselves. So uh, we played one up in London. There's a, a, a pub or... Pub stroke dive bar up in London called the Devonshire Arms, which um, is in Camden Town, is a really important part of the London music scene. Almost yeah. every night, almost every night, they put on uh, free free shows. Cool, uh, and it's been a really important part of. Well, mainly because they're the only people that put us on. <laughs> uh, we've we've played there quite a lot, and um, it's sort of our our second our second home, really. Um, so we were able to play a release show up there a few weeks back that went went down really well, and then locally we've we've not had a lot of venues, uh, a lot of venues shut down sort of over the past five or six years, just as we started as a band really. Uh, so we've 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 always struggled to, to sort of play anywhere that can take a full heavy metal band in terms of like mm-hmm. um, acoustics and things like that because. Um, but a local di- another local dive bar sort of re- refitted itself out over the past six months, and again, are doing loads of music. So we managed to put on a show down there last Friday, proper local, like literally five five minutes down the road. Uh, a load of friends and family came along, and it was it was an absolute riot. So that that was really great. But um, you know, of all the things we're good at as a band, from the business side of things, you know, the PR, writing it, recording it, we really really struggled to get to get shows and for us getting our head above the pulpit is about trying to get shows rather than trying to get reviews ironically so um we, we've always really struggled for some reason to, to 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 get those shows but those two we put on ourselves 
we've got another couple coming up over Christmas where uh, over Christmas over the summer where um, <laughs> we, we, wish wish of the year away here um, <laughs> yeah. uh, over the summer that that some uh, friends have asked us to like back other bands that we've played with have, have asked us to play um, and I think we're going to put on another local show again in maybe September or October and ask a couple more bands to come down and play and I think we're going to try and make that a fairly regular thing try and get a bit of a scene going again um, but locally but yeah playing live is my probably my favorite part of what we do as a band yeah it's the most it's getting those shows is is the most difficult part because we're sort of we're very close to london which means there isn't much of a scene but we're not in london so we're not part of the london scene um and that's always been a uh a difficulty for us but you know you can't have everything in life can you right right um have you toured uh outside the uk like um I like, I, I shit you not, it's difficult to get shows more than 30 miles away from where we are, let alone. Um, so we've literally never played maybe more than 40 or 50 miles away from where from where we are. So we, when I say we struggle to get shows, I really mean we struggle to get, like, shows. Um, so uh, tour, tour's never been on the... Uh, we, we've tried a couple of times to put, like, a little three night tours together that um haven't haven't come about because of real life basically you know um stuff happening which meant that we couldn't organize that we still intend to do that um to try and do a couple of weekend tours in the uk but um what used to be very very easy in terms of traveling to europe um to do anything holiday shopping whatever is now much more difficult after we let after the UK left the European Union a couple of years ago. So um the the, the travel outside of UK has become much, much more difficult where it used to be very, very easy to do that in terms of the sorts of I don't know, you know if you paperwork that you need to do it. So it's a bit more of a uh, a pain in the ass these days to be able to you can't just jump on the ferry and pop over to France for the day as easy as you could. So we'd we'd like to one day but um, like I said, we'll just we'll, we would settle with some some shows in some other cities other than London at the moment. Yeah, right on. Um, what's your uh, your favorite venue to play at? So, well, so I, I need to say the Dev, the Devonshire Arms, because they they let us play there all the time. Uh, but just over the road in Camden, there's a uh, a bar and venue called the Black Heart, and um, that's uh, so downstairs is like a dive bar type uh type pub and then upstairs there's a there's a little venue which uh i i'm i'm 45 these days i've been going to gigs for a very long time and i've i'm sick to the back teeth of going to see shows big shows like 2000 plus people with like views at the bar and cloakrooms and so i like little gigs these days yeah and the and it's about 150 capacity up 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 upstairs at the Black Heart. We've pl- we've played there a few times. Um, the sounds great, and that's 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 lovely to play up there. Really enjoy the the Black Heart. Where I want to play is again just over the road from that in Camden. There's yeah. a, a legendary um, venue called the Underworld. Uh, so there's a pub called the World's End, and then underneath that there's a there's a venue called uh, the Underworld, which again I've seen maybe hundreds of shows there and that's that's the one i want to play uh yeah. if, I can play, if i can play that one day i'll i'll die happy there's literally a pit you have to go down into the pit to uh to to see the band so um that's that's the place i want to want to be able to play at least once hell yeah well um uh... who um who got you inspired uh, to sing like who's your favorite singer uh it's, again the problem is i've been um l- listening to music now for so long <laughs> yeah we try and like think back like who was it who was it um but my my mum's like a uh, uh amateur opera opera singer so has always okay. has always sung so sort of that aspect has always been uh been around uh, and weirdly, because she was an amateur opera singer, I've pretty much, as a kid, was dragged along to every single opera yeah. that's probably ever been written. 
so I have a, I have a strange knowledge and recognition of a hell of a lot of opera stuff. But um, at the same time, you know, uh, bands like when I was a kid, like Queen, were playing a lot in the car and things like that. So that sort of I've always really been into music, and we, you know, babysitters would come round and they play like eighties pop music and stuff like that. So music's always been really important. But then I think because of you know how old I am, the um starting to hear bands like Guns N' Roses, starting to hear bands like Metallica was, again, another big sort of twitch up. Um, and I think I'll always go back to my, my the, for me, my favourite album of all time, the most influential, the one I still listen to when when I get the opportunity is the first Rage Against the Machine album. Yeah. Um, and Zach Delaroche's vocals on that are still, I think, un- unparalleled, quite frankly, in terms of... Yeah. Uh, how heartfelt they are, the anger behind them, the yeah. quality of the lyrics. It's just, just it's still just everything for me. And um uh I can probably almost sing every single word of that of that first yeah. record, you know, I without, hear, yeah. without even thinking about it. So um and over the years, you know, there's been a number of vocalists who I've who I've always looked up to and but that but that album is pretty much the I after I thought I thought about it a lot over the years, and that still is the sort of keystone record for me, and it's the keystone vocal performance. That it's like if I could ever do anything like that, then I'd be over the moon. So that's that's probably where it where it starts from. Hell yeah, man, that's awesome. Um, if uh, James and I were going to come out and visit for a little bit, and if we went to the Quills, have you been there? It's a the restaurant. Quills? Yeah, in, in Rochester, it looks fucking awesome. Is it? Does it? Is it as good as it? Is it looks? Uh, so two things. One is uh, my best mate who just lives around the corner, Rich. He um, for a while tried started up a little craft beer can shop in half of the Quills before it became as big as it was. Yeah. Uh, so I spent a few weekends with him in there. Uh, with him selling selling craft beer and me drinking a little bit of craft beer for was it who is it my son's birthday my dad's birthday we had a birthday and we went down there and I had quite a nice burger it was quite nice my son had uh, it was my son's birthday because he had a donut burger and he quite he quite enjoyed it and it was quite nice that time so that was pretty, I think it was just before lockdown maybe so just before the pandemic. But then I went down there last year and had breakfast. I went to get a tattoo done and I went to get a big breakfast first. And it was about 10 quid for a breakfast. And I've got to say, I was a little bit disappointed. <laughs> uh. So uh, last time I was there, it was it was a little bit disappointed. But, but Rochester High Street's turned, you know, ended up having some really some really good restaurants in it. For years, it's been, it's always been good down there. But the last couple of years, there's some really nice place, places set up. A uh, couple of nice sort of pubs and bars uh, uh, open down there, but um, I'd, I'd I'd prefer to go along the road to Chuck and Blades, which is a sort of smash burger okay. place. Which, which beer, beer wise is always a bit dodgy, but the burgers in there are absolutely fantastic. So hell yeah, smash burger yeah, is awesome. the way to go. Always the way to go. Yeah, and I after love that, a good smash burger. After that, we carry on back up the high street to uh, a place called the Three uh, the Three Sheets. Which uh, is a new a new pub, but the building it's set in is like um, like three, four, five hundred years old, uh, and was like the start of Rochester High Street. And elements of it are still, you know, there's still the original elements of it. And a family took over who are like uh, I think either come from or live for a very long time in Austria. So it's like an Anglo Austrian German pub. Um, and they do some really really nice sort of straight up normal like good. German lagers, uh, really nice atmosphere in there, and they've started to put like acoustic music on and stuff in the back. So that's a really nice pint in, pint in there as well. Hell yeah, nice, very nice. I, I'll uh, take you on a whole tour of all the good places in Rochester. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I moved to the US from Australia, and before that, I was in New Zealand. And honestly, the thing I miss the most is uh, pub culture. Like, uh, it's hard to explain to Americans, uh, like. It's kind of like your community hub. Like you go there, it's where you see your friends, it's where you see your family. It's like your comfortable place. Like you're at a local, you know what I mean? Like it's, they don't really mm-hmm. have that as much in the US and it's a shame. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's been really difficult for pub, Republic, uh, not Republicans, publicans. Uh, <laughs> over, 
mm. over uh, you know over the past maybe ten years here. There's just so you know the cost of living that we've got. There's the tax tax on on alcohol in pubs is really high, mm. and so many of those local pubs have have, have shut down, and almost all of them turned into turned into houses. There's obviously there, there's still still plenty left, but more and more are going away and. Um, it's part of the culture, a, though, it's like it's, it's a real shame. It, it is massively, and um, so so sort of new bars and, and places opening up are great. They are often not quite the same. They're probably it's probably more that bar culture than it is pub culture. I mean, right, you still get the same people going in there, and you know, it's not a million miles away, but um, right. often you're in non like almost all the pubs were built as pubs. So yeah. you're in a purpose built in tavern pub that was built to be a pub. Right. And a lot of those are now moving it up, being made into residentials and, and shops. And if a new place opens up, it's often in a place that is not a pub. It yeah. is a building that is now going to be a pub. Right. Um, and the Three Sheets, as I was talking about, wasn't a pub, but it's kind of old enough that it has that feel still. Right. Uh, there's a number of other places that have opened up that that don't quite feel like that. Um, as opposed to like before I did this today, we we took the dog out for a walk up on Bluebell Hill. There's like a 15th century tavern up there that's awesome. um, that that we sat sat in the garden and have a pint. That's still, that's our local. I mean, it's about two miles up the road, and sometimes we walk up there and sometimes we drive up there. But it's surrounded by woods and. Um, very cool. We we often take the dog up there, and that that's mainly our local now. But that has that feeling. So we walk in, and it's they say hello and how's the dog, mm-hmm. and are all that sort of stuff. And that and that still does feel like that sort of um, that that culture you're talking about. But yeah, more and more pubs are shutting, and it's it's kind of heartbreaking. Even if they're horrible pubs, if you see one shut, you're like, oh, that's 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 shitty. So yeah, um, agreed. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's just the fact that. You- that's the place you go for to see the people you know, because to have the food that you like. Like there's game nights, you know, they have the yeah. raffles and stuff. Like, yeah, it's just it's it's hard. It's not a bar. A bar is so different. A bar is somewhere you go to drink. It's not somewhere you go for a sense of community. Um, yeah, yeah. Gen- generally not. But, um, Brendan, yeah, uh, any more food questions there from you? Are you, are you uh, satisfied? I'm good there, there, yeah. Cool. Anything else you want to ask? Um, I was gonna ask about the castles, unless you were. No, you go ahead. I have the history degree, but uh, you ask it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, go for it. Uh, you go for it. No, I was. we just looked at a look on, on Google before. We always check out every town before we interview someone from it. But for, for such a small place, you have like a crazy amount of historical buildings. With some, some really cool castles and some really manners. cool old manors. Yeah. So um, although I'm from Rochester, Rochester sits within the Medway Towns. Which is uh, Gillingham, Rochester, Chatham, and Strood. Not in that order. They're literally a lot in a line <laughs> along along the river. And when you combine those four towns together, that literally links. There's no, you know, it's they are they're all linked together. We're we're pretty much city size. Okay. Um, and the two important aspects of why it's we've got so much so much culture and well culture history at least if not culture (laughs) is uh rochester sits on the river medway and basically that's the first place the romans crossed Ah. when they landed to get to london so on the river medway uh about as the crow flies probably about two miles uh north is a plaque by a river in the middle of a field which says this is where we think the Romans tried to cross the river and got beaten up by um, uh, the locals 2,000 <laughs> years ago or wherever it is. Uh, awesome. so, the cro- so the crossing at Rochester, the bridge the bridge and bridges there is a massive important strategic point and always has been. So that's why we've got a castle there. The, the keep that, that was built used to be a Roman fort and then on wow. top of that was was built uh, the, the Norman keep that I think is something like the oldest still standing Norman keep in 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 the UK. Wow. Uh, then add to that, we've also got because we're on the river a massive dockyard that's no longer really operates as a, as a dockyard, but 
up until the early 80s, and certainly before that, was a major part of the naval infrastructure of the UK. All right. So it built warships uh, up until the Second World War, I think. Wow. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it was ma- a massive employer of, of, of the Medway towns. And that's uh, so those two things together, plus we're a commuter town for London, mm-hmm. means actually it's it's probably over heavy with the amount of forts, castles, um, the dockyards, all sorts that we've got we've got going on here. So my, my daughter goes to a to a, her school is literally an old an old Napoleonic fort on a hill. That's so, so cool. um and then they, we used to practice in another fort. <laughs> so there's a there's another fort up the road that we, we used to practice in. We now practice in a room down Chatham Dockyard that sits just behind an old navy um frigate <laughs> that's wow. on a dry dock. Um and that to get to that, we have to drive past another fort, another big <laughs> fort as well. So, um, riddled with forts and tunnels and, and and all sorts, and all based around the fact that it's got easy access to the river mm-hmm. and the sea, and it was a, it's a, it was a major crossing point for for hundreds, if not thousands, of years for like the Romans and other armies and things like that. Wow. So, um, and the castle itself, there's at least one movie about it. Um, so there were, is it, was it the Peasants Revolt? All based around like Magna Carta and ancient um, lawmaking in in the UK, in the UK, England, if not the UK. There was a there was a, a few sieges, and one of the sieges was made into a movie starring James Portnoy. Is it uh, called Ironbound? And okay. um, it's not a bad movie actually. They play we, we they put it on in the grounds on a big on a big proper cinema screen and um the famous bit is so if you go down there there's four of the keep itself there's four towers three of them are square and one is round okay. and that's because uh as part of this siege to break into the t- the keep uh the um the the attackers the siegers dug underneath that corner tower uh and if anyone who doesn't like you know uh, this is a bit gross in terms of <laughs> animals being hurt, but they pushed uh, a herd of pigs into it, set fire to the pigs and the burning, yeah. of the, the heat of the pig fat and other explosives brought down the tower. Wow. Um, and they had to rebuild it. So by the time they'd rebuilt it after the siege, um, castles had stopped building things square. And started building things round to deflect, <laughs> to deflect stuff like new cannonballs and things that were wow. coming in. So one of them is a more modern tower. I mean, it's still like hundreds of years old, but one of them is round and the rest of them are square. And you can see most of that in in yeah the movie Ironbound. So um, it's a uh, it, it's a it's a good movie. Well, it's not good. It's a fun movie at least. That's awesome. I mean, that was a much better answer than I was expecting. Thank you for the history <laughs> lesson. Yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Brennan, you got any other ones? Um, no, I'm good to go. Cool. I, I can cool. tell you, I can tell you about the Fisherman's Union if you want. That um, <laughs> there's one person left. If you go down the Guildhall Museum, they tell you about all the oysters that used to be able to fish from the river. I can go on and on. Um, <laughs> I've, lived here, I've lived here too long, clearly. <laughs> no, I love that. That's awesome. I, I appreciate anyone that actually knows the history and culture of their own town or city. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, you should. Not enough people do, honestly. Uh, as I was going to ask, uh, actually, I just, before I ask anything, I just wanted to say you, you talked about Trepanation Recordings and Dan Dolby. I just want to actually give him a shout out because we're, we're big fans of Trepanation and Dan's mm, work. Yeah. And basically, I just want to say thank you to him for, for working with so many bands and putting out so much varied and underground music. The dude's a legend. Yeah, he's um, he's been great. So, um, again, I don't, I don't think I've ever spoken to him. We just, for a while, I was sending him about three emails a day and... Um, uh, often in this business, you send an email, then you sit there waiting forever and ever for it to come back, and you're getting mm. you like, all right, do I do, do I send a reminder? Have I waited long enough? But mm. He's been so easy to work with. Like you yeah. ask him a question, he gives you an answer, um, and uh, has just been great. Everything he did, he said he was going to do, he did. Everything we got stuff on time. 
absolute dream to work with, which is is not always our experience with stuff. So, um, yeah, I've said it a number of times, but massive thanks to to, to Dan. And hopefully we were going to try and work on him on a couple of other non-all-father things as well because he's just, just been so reliable mm-hmm. um, in terms of... Um, in terms of being able to be able to do this, so um, yeah, cheers, Dan. Yeah, I uh, we've known Dan for a while now. He's actually come on our podcast. So uh, I think it was like two years ago or something like that. Um, yeah, that's when we first he, started up. Yeah, it's him and Roger Mortis who owns uh, Curse Monk Records. Both came on together. Um, but uh, he's super reliable. I know exactly what you mean because we've done premieres for him, and he's contributed tracks to our charity samples. Like basically within an hour of messaging him or emailing him, you get something back from him. It's awesome to work with him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely great. So I, I have, uh, I guess, two more questions for you. Uh, one is, uh, is there anything in 2022 so far that stood out to you? Like, what are you listening to these days? 2023? Uh, three, three years, I should say, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, last track of years. <laughs> so um, I have been mostly listening to the last few weeks, a band called Initiate, who are a hardcore band from, I'm going to say America, because I'm not entirely sure where. Uh, and I like I've liked a couple of the previous stuff. I think they're on Triple B Records, who are just putting out so much good music at the moment. It is absolutely ridiculous in terms of quality hardcore that doesn't sound like the previous record they put out. But Initiate are again foundations built in very much hardcore, but have managed to put some really nice melodic guitar, like almost melodic rock guitars over the top. Um, like really aggressive vocals, but with just sort of really great lead guitar melodies over the back. Um, what's the album called? I listened to it earlier. So it's Initiate, uh, and the record is called. Uh, it's called uh, Cerebral Circus. Mm. Okay. Um, I really recommend it if you if you're into hardcore. So I've been listening to that quite a bit. Um, the Necropanther album has been on loads. There's a band called Underneath, and their record, their EP is called Nothing Here Is Held Sacred, and mm. they sound like a really like nasty, gnarly Gajira. Nice. Um, they do a bit. They do a few things actually, but I think that's the one thing you, I, I find Gajira these days fairly, fairly boring. And um, th- th- these are really aggressive and 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 just take that sort of almost genty type feel, but they make it horrible. Like imagine Gajira released on Southern Lord record type, type yes. sounds. Um, the street tombs record on carbonized records. They're from um, nice little sort of DBE death, death metal punky nice. type stuff. Um, and then what was the other thing I had? Uh, oh, I hope I pronounced these right. Uh, Ooze Cost, I should know how to pronounce them because I've just bought one of their T-shirts and I've just bought all their records. But they've been releasing singles over the past uh, three or four months okay. um, and do a, a, a sort of black metal, punky black metal type thing. And um, right. they've they've got some... Re- they're, they're, I'm slightly frustrated they haven't released an album and it is singles because I find it quite difficult to keep track of singles. Um, yeah. But they are really, really good. So it's U Z U Z K O S T, and they are uh, intense. Really, really good though. Really good. Um, and like I said, I've just I've just had one of their. their I spent a lot of money on shipping to get one of their long sleeves <laughs> sent over, uh, and it's just arrived. And I'm uh, looking forward to to throwing that on and and wearing and wearing that. Awesome. I have to check them out. I haven't actually heard of that one. Music, it was tea. Um, oh wow, that's some really cool album art for the, some of the singles there. Yeah, I like it, it. The advantage of putting out the singles, I think, like that, as you can spend the time on each one to like make kind of make it special. Mm-hmm. We just had like different versions of our album art when we put the our, our singles out for this record, but they've been able to like really concentrate on the individual ones, and they are um, <clears throat> they look fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And that, there's that one single called uh, "For Property and Profit," and the album art's like a police officer on his knees praying with a pig mask on with the AK-47 in the back of his yeah. <laughs> head. Like I said, wow. they're intense. <laughs> no, they're from Pittsburgh. All right. Yeah, Rust Belt black metal. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I said two, two, uh, two more questions. I actually thought of a third one. Uh, second one would be, uh, are there any bands in your area that people should hear about? Like what are some local acts that maybe aren't known that, that people should know? Uh, again, we local wise, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult down here because there's not right. much of a scene. Like, so we're hopefully, we're getting together. But some of the bands we've been that we've been playing with uh, have been really supportive of. There's Warp Stormer, who do like a, a really energetic stoner, stoner rock, stoner metal type mm-hmm. um, type thing. Which you know, I, I often find that sort of doom and stoner stuff can be really repetitive and really, really dull. But they they really inject it with some uh, some energy, and they in particular they got a song called "Ride the Bomb," which is which is fantastic. Uh-huh. Uh, we've been playing with a band called uh, Row of Ashes as well, who do a um, Will Haven type uh, early early two thousands like sludgy hardcore type type noise uh, yeah. as well. Um, so they're they're really nice guys. They're well, well worth well yeah, well worth checking out as well. Uh, the other day we played with a band who their drummer was our one of our previous drummers called Sun Messiah, um, and they do a really good like uh, sort of early Mastodon type type approach to stuff, like really awesome. nice heavy elements and melodic, melodic elements as well. Um, so yeah, those 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 three in particular who we've we've played with and hung out with recently have been have been really good um oh who's the other one uh carib as well k-a-r-a-b played a couple of shows shows with them who do I don't know, what do they do um almost like all metal type melodic stuff and they're really interesting and uh, and do some really interesting stuff like go from like heavy to quite a few dynamics and stuff in there and um that again they've been really cool to hang out with as well I think I just found them now. This is they're based out of London. It's K A R A B. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So they're uh, post hardcore, progressive hardcore alternative. Yeah, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't say any of that really captures exactly what they do. But <laughs> awesome. Um, but yeah, they're 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 they're, they're great live, and um, like I said, we've played played a couple of times with them now, and they're they're really cool to hang out with. So um, they're good as well. Awesome. I'm gonna check them out as well. Been writing down all these names. Fantastic. Yeah, I always do the same. Love it. So the last question is kind of a, an ambush question, but it's, a, it's just a fun one. Uh, if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only bring three CDs with you to listen to and you had a solar powered disc so you could keep listening to them until you got rescued, what would the three albums be? I was asked this before and my answer was the three new ones that I've just bought because I haven't listened to them yet and the uh, the hosts are really disappointed <laughs> with that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally uh, fair. <laughs> they were like, oh right, okay. Um it would be the I am trying to think of the records I would go back to and listen to maybe once a year in full, usually after I've had a couple of beers and everyone's in bed and I've got my headphones on. Uh so one would be the Rage Against the Machine debut. Nice mm. for sure. Uh one would be uh Boy Sets Fire after the eulogy. Okay. All right. Uh, who are one of my favourite bands, and when it comes to like again vocals uh, and in particular lyric lyrical approach, I always uh, love their uh, cover of um, Wrecking Ball. Uh, uh, it's a uh, oh god no, what was it? Um, it's a holiday in Cambodia. Oh, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard that. Boy, oh, that's fire! Yeah, it. check it out. Yeah. You gotta find it. It's somewhere out there in the world. I know it. Oh, I have I it on a did- CD. Oh, okay. I know they did Miley Cyrus Wrecking Ball that I never really got around to listening to. But <laughs> um but yeah, their their is it their second album, I think, after the after Unity's their second album was a big again, a big game changer to me in terms of being able to write lyrics that were inc- like both aggressive, catchy, heartfelt, and at times really emotional as well. So whenever I go and see them play, I end up in a ball of Ball of Tears during at least three or four songs. So um that record. And then um probably something uh I tell you what, probably a uh Devin Townsend record that I haven't yet listened to. Um mainly because they can often be like either really difficult to get into and in terms of boredom factor, I can keep I can keep listening to it and try to get into it, or they're 
instantly accessible and amazing and therefore for you happy. But uh, some sort of Devin Townsend, a new Devin Townsend record that I hadn't yet heard, um, where maybe he was feeling particularly, particularly uh, tricksy on it and has put together a weird thing, something like that that you can really like spend time with, you know, and, and dig deep into just so yeah. you've got, got something to do. Awesome. Great choices. Um, I was just going to say yeah, before, no. it's like, oh, you picked those three that you just bought. It would suck if one of them turned out to be like, oh, I really don't like this, actually. I only heard the yeah, one single. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen anymore, does it, really? But Because you can usually listen to something beforehand. But right. back when I was young, you'd spend 15, 16 quid on a CD, and you'd be like, I'd maybe have heard one song from it. And you were like, oh, well, let's hope this is good. Because <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you'd, you'd waste a load of money. So... Um, I don't, you know, not even many people buy CDs these days, but um, uh, at least you can, I don't know, is it better or worse? I don't know, it's different in it. You can pretty much hear it before you buy it anyway, if you want. So, um, but that certainly never used to be the case. No, it's, it's like a double-edged sword as well, because it means like you, you may not even listen to it on CD once you've already heard it like three or four times waiting for it to arrive. Um, it takes some of the excitement out of it for sure. But also it does let you prevent you from buying something after hearing like two singles the band put on YouTube or something and gets there and like 15 tracks and two of them are good and 13 suck. Yeah. yeah. I've I've probably got maybe about 10 CDs. I've slowed down on, I, I, I try and spend money on bands where I can, but I probably buy more merch like shirts these days than CDs. Me too. But I've got about five or six that I can see on my shelf at the moment that are still wrapped up that I bought, but I haven't actually got around to listening to the CD because I've been listening to the records on, on Spotify and, and Bandcamp. Right. But my, my car still has a CD player. And if I can be, be asked to do it, listening to the CD on the CD player is the best quality version of the album I can listen to. Um, the, there is a real difference in quality between streaming, download MP3 and actually just putting the CD on in the car. Right. Have you um have you ever checked out Tidal, the streaming service? Uh, I, I keep being. T- I've we I've got a family and we've got family Spotify and I don't pay for it. The other half okay. does, so I'm just keeping stum and okay. not changing anything because <laughs> I don't have to pay for it at the moment. So just because uh, tid- Tidal's got like better quality streaming, hasn't it? Yeah, than, yeah. They've got like vinyl master quality, which is. Awesome. You can really hear the difference between yeah. that. Like, so if you put like a title master on and play the same thing on Spotify, it's like a huge difference oh, between the two. You can hear the compression from Spotify. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the cool thing, there's a couple of things about title that like Brendan and I switched over because we really love a couple of the things about their business model and stuff. Like, uh, they give the highest, like, uh, cost mm. per stream to the artist, but then also whichever artist you listen to the most each month, uh, they get like $5 out of your monthly membership to them. Um, so if you like really like artists to support them, then they'll actually get paid for it, which is kind of cool. Um, that that does sound, that that does sound cool. And um, like I said, most ma- the majority of stuff I buy at least is is Bandcamp these days, all through Bandcamp. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, and I try and make sure that if I've bought it on Bandcamp, I'm you know I can then listen to it for convenience sake. But yeah, um, now, now you know I've still got the, the, like, the I'm literally looking at about. Eight nine hundred CDs on the, awesome. on the shelf, um, and I've got probably about another thousand upstairs that that I've collected over the years. And one day I, I will have my own music room in my house when all the kids have gone off to wherever they're going to go to. So I'll be able to <laughs> get right. them all out on one shelf and listen to them all yeah. properly. But, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, in the process of building a, a space like that you know i was like well we have a den and uh it's begging for like built-in shelves so i'm like oh that's where i'll put all the records and the cds and all that but then i'm like oh my kids are gonna destroy that shit you know like they're still young so well i've got uh what so i've got three kids one's at university that comes back every now and again but we've, we've used his room for the office which where i'm supposed to be at the moment uh and then the other one the youngest is 16 now and she's um I don't think she's ever going to leave though, so I think I'm just going to have to buy a bigger house. So <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think that 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 third bedroom is going to become available at any point. So yeah, I think I'm going to have to just get a bigger house before I ever get a den. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, so we're coming up on time here, so I'll just wrap up Ooh. here. Both, I just want to give you a chance before we finish. Uh, if people want to listen to your music, buy your music, follow you on socials, where should they do these things? 
Uh, on Twitter, we're all f- at All Father UK. We're on Bandcamp. Just search All Father, and it probably won't find it the first three times. But when you do it on the fourth time, it will, because God knows what the search <laughs> function on, on Bandcamp is so useless. But yeah, um, our record of Violent Truth was out thirty first of March. You can pick it up on Bandcamp or listen to it on Tidal or Spotify or any of the other uh, services. We've got CDs available on Bandcamp. We've got loads of shirts. No one's bought any shirts this time around. So if you want to buy a shirt, please go out to Bandcamp and and, and buy one. So I need to get oh, some yeah. space in, in the boot of the car because it's filled with merchandise boxes at the moment. Um and uh, if you've heard of Violent Truth and like it and not heard of previous records, go check out And All Be Desolation and Bless the Earth With Fire because they're both pretty good as well. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. It was a great conversation. And uh, if you do another album, like when you do another album in the future, I'd love to have you back on to talk about that one. Would love to. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I got to talk about Rochester Castle, which is always enjoyable. <laughs> always awesome yeah. history. Yeah. Mix yeah. It up. <laughs> and for anyone listening at home thanks for tuning in and come back next week for another guest 